Maybe we can start this discussion on longevity um, to get listeners here on the same page with the blue zones. For some people, I think a lot of listeners will be familiar, but for those who aren't, uh, can you define the blue zones and tell listeners a little bit more about the insights they've given us into longevity? Yeah, you know, I think it's really been more of a, we've kind of blundered into um, all these zones or areas of the world where people tend to live longer. And, and we've backed in by using population analysis and study of just of the kinds of life they lead and the things that work or don't work. A lot of this has been Dan Butner and um, work over the last 20 years, and uh, a lot of it was supported by National Geographic. But uh, uh, your listeners might recognize that from a few uh, very prominent articles in Time Magazine, National Geographic Magazine, and on the television. Uh, but I think what it did give us was a perspective that uh, even though we saw places in large groups and swaths of population where health that wasn't good and longevity was good, there were these pockets, these special places. And I think now we know that those special places bred special people. Yeah, it is amazing to see, you know, we go across from, you know, Sardinia, Okinawa, Loma Linda, Costa Rica, and Icaria in, in Greece and all of a sudden, these folks are living 10 years longer than everybody else. There's less chronic disease. They're more active. Um, so that definitely sort of sets the stage for how I suppose the rest of us can live longer. And you do such a great job in your book of diving into the physiology of aging. Um, so perhaps you could outline, you know, you talk about the seven pathways of aging. Could you walk listeners through a few of those key pathways in the in yeah, increasing I, health span? Yeah, a, a lot of this has become this sort of beautiful, unified me metabolic theory of aging. And I think really what it comes down to is this, this tug of war in the body between energy and error. So when you look at the, the various, the seven sort of zones or areas where in your body where the battle is being fought between uh, era, energy and error, you look at first the most basic zone, the area of the DNA where damage is going on and the damage can occur at various levels. You know, it's very complicated and it's amazing, you know, this, this combat, this war that's going on in your body. Um, every time our cells divide, it's a violent act. There's damage both to the DNA and to the energy levels that it takes to fix the damage that occurs in the DNA. You know, I always liken it to the, to how we pack our DNA. It's, it's, into the chromosomes, it, I, we always thought it was this beautiful sort of Japanese tea ceremony of, <laughs> of, of everything is perfect and it proceeds in this wonderful. It's like when my Eloquent. wife and I go, my wife and I go on vacation, and when I come back, my bag looks like uh, her bag's perfect, right? When she undoes her luggage, it's often when you open mine up, it's like uh, a jack in the box, things flying everywhere. And unfortunately, our bodies are more jack in the box than tea service. So we've got to repair all that. And that's, that, that is really where all this gets down to. And, uh, um, and really, as science is catching up to these sort of ideas of damage, we use a lot of our energy in our body to fix the damage we do. And, and this chaotic um, life that our cells leads, uh, that's really where all the game is. So you see it in... Um, the breakdown of DNA every time we we uh, our cells divide, we see it in then the breakdown of the proteins as we make mistakes. I mean, we're really good in our body at at quantity, but we're not so good in quality, you know. <laughs> and we've got to fix those um, those broken and damaged proteins. Luckily, we have a ways. Our body is elegant ways of finding it, but. You know, we have chaperone proteins. Uh, the Nobel Prize last year in biochemistry was to a Japanese scientist who described this wonderful laundry system in our body where we recycle our own proteins. So we have these very complex, these chaperone proteins that find the damaged stuff and, and, and we do it, recycle it, fix it, fold it correctly so the laundry looks good. But the problem is more energy. And that begins to sap us, right? Then it goes even further the stem cells in your body begin to get exhausted, right? We can't replace them. We only have a certain number of those. And as you get older, the number of circulating stem cells begins to decline. 
and then it goes further, our cells then have more and more difficulty talking to each other. So that communication among the cells begins to decline, and that makes it harder for us to sense energy and nutrients. That's why you start to develop secondary type 2 onset diabetes and other problems. And then it gets worse, right? <laughs> it's just, it's a, this awful decline, you know, it's a spiral. It's really an Icarian spiral in a way, you know, as we begin to try to fix those problems, other problems get worse. The cells can't talk correctly. Then we begin to, to try to turn on growth and the things that get turned on are unfortunately things we don't want to grow, like cancer or develop other thickening or inflammation in our cells, which drives a lot of this. And then we don't help ourselves either, you know. What we, drive, we get into social uh, issues of obesity and other things that actually just turn this cycle up and drive inflammation and other the, pro other the problems that we have. And, and the funny thing about all this is that when I, when I was a medical student, when I trained, I thought all this was genetics. You got a good set of genes, you got a bad set of genes. And what we know now is that our genes are really effervescent. You know, they're constantly changing, constantly adapting. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, you do such a great job of outlining, you know, those signs of cellular aging. Like you mentioned the DNA damage, epigenetic alterations, yes. uh, you know, deregulation of that nutrient sensing. And, of course, mitochondria play a big role in this as well, obviously. The, yeah, the, the, I, th I think that's the – isn't that fascinating? I mean, we've got these, these sort of our little symbiotic overlords that have been with us for <laughs> – just so, you know, where do they, where they even come from? Where are they – you know, they really – they require payment for services rendered. You know, they give us all our energy, 90% of our energy. But they also – fight for the energy with ourselves you know they're fighting all the time struggling who gets to use the atp where does it go who makes it you know who uses it you know it's this one reservoir we're working with it's fascinating though yeah absolutely and i mean if we continue down this road a little bit more i know there's a lot of talk especially in the blogospheres around you know if we talk about the blue zones whether it's vegetarian diets omnivore diets which one's yeah. superior for longevity you know what did you uncover in your research for the book you know i th it, it's funny because i think that i was really bracing for that i would find some magical formula in there you know i thought oh i'm gonna discover this overarching theme i thought oh the blue zones that it would be you know some food that they shared, some genetic background that they shared. And all I realized is that when you really looked at the blue zones, these were rough, very, very harsh areas. You know, they selected for the toughest of us. And then when you look more, at, in, go to the next level, see what they're eating, what they're doing, you know. All, the overarching theme is that everyone seems to have basically a plant-based diet. And I think that that is something I think you can take home from all this. But, you know, the more I realize, the more I realize that, you know, as humans, our, our gift really isn't our intellect. It's our metabolic flexibility. You know, we can live on almost anything. If you look at people can thrive in in the African plains, they can thrive in the Antarctic ice. They can, I mean, they can live off anything. Even societies that seasonally change diets. Well, you know, if you're, you know, a Hansa tribesman somewhere in Africa, and you eat meat when it meets there, and you eat honey when the honey's there, you know. So the diets can shift, and we do this all the time. That's really, that's really our genetic advantage, you know. So I guess what I realized is that the diet. It's important, right? And and I and I don't want to discount that, but I guess I came up with this a little bit of a nihilistic conclusion that it was, as far as longevity is concerned, the main thing was not overeating, which was our number one problem, you know. And that if we exercise and we we exercise, those were the powerful things that that changed the the genetic makeup that gave us our our genetic advantage. Yeah, it is amazing when you parse through some of that research that whether, you know, vegetarian, omnivore, the, there's no real difference in mortality rates amongst the two in these really big um, population-based studies. And, you know, you hit on it right there in terms of movement, exercise, activity. But maybe before we jump in there, you, you talked yeah. about sort of the environment that we live in today. Obviously, 
We have about two thirds of the population now, more or less overweight, obese, uh, the type two diabetes epidemic. So, you know, for yourself as a as a surgeon, I mean, I've heard some docs describe osteoarthritis as sort of diabetes of the joints. You know, what do you think is contributing to a lot of the conditions that you are seeing? You know, if I had to to look deeper beyond what the real overarching issue is, it's really inflammation, right? So it's inflammation of joints, it's inflammation of muscles, inflammation, even even um, even in the way we think, you know. So one of the biggest drivers of inflammation is uh, are, is the obesity, really. It's you know because it it unhinges, it it disconnects our ability to sense nutrients. And, you know, we evolved not in times of plenty, right? You know, we, we're basically hunting for food, whatever we could get. And, and what happens when you don't eat as much is that rather than your metabolism slowing down, which is what we were always thought, it actually speeds up. And that's why, you know, uh, that's why things like intermittent fasting are so powerful and how they can rev up your metabolism and your thinking and your thought processes. It can change the way your metabolism functions in very profound ways. 